Greg really could have given any talk today. We, he, he's more than qualified and an expert in every area of advanced endoscopy, and we really could have had him speak about anything. But among his areas of interest and expertise, uh, Greg is notably uh, interested in things such as endoscopic management of Barrett's esophagus, the role of EMR in the resection of duodenal and ampullary neoplasia in familial adenomatous polyps, all facets pertaining to ERCP and endoscopic ultrasound. And more recently, he's uh, brought to Penn per, per oral endoscopic anatomy or POLEM for the management of endoscopy. Greg has truly enjoyed a prolific career in GI and endoscopy that has culminated in recognition, recognition of his contributions in numerous ways. Uh, he has been the director of endoscopic services at the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania since 1995, and then in 2005 was named the executive director of endoscopic services uh, for the entire University of Pennsylvania health system. I can go on listing his numerous other administrative responsibilities, research accomplishments, and awards, uh, but I'll focus on two of his most uh, recent and important achievements. Uh, in from 2011 to 2012, Greg served as the president of our National GI Endoscopy Society, the ASGE, uh, where he had a highly successful term, which included overseeing the strategic planning for the ASGE for the ensuing decade, uh, with his ultimately helping to develop the ASGE headquarters uh, and the IT&T Training Center uh, in Downers Grove, Illinois. And then in 2019, Greg received the Rudolf Schindler Award, which is the ASGE's highest honor granted to a member whose accomplishments in endoscopic research, teaching, and service to the ASGE exemplify the standards and traditions of Rudolf Schindler, who was the founder of the American Gastro Club, uh, which is the forerunner of the ASGE. So uh, he has really held two of the most prominent positions in the field uh, in the past decade. Now, Greg is one of the most respected endoscopists in the U.S. and abroad, and I would joke that despite his passion for Philly sports teams, he's considered an all-around good guy. Um, and on a personal level, Greg has been an advocate and supporter of me and my career, and I am extremely grateful uh, for that. Due to the ongoing pandemic, we were unfortunately not able to have Greg out for the traditional uh, dinner the night before Grand Rounds. Uh, but as I said, we're fortunate to have him uh, via webcam today. Uh, speaking to us on serrated colon lesion. That's Matt. I'll turn it over to Greg. Chris, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I wish, uh, I, actually, I'm glad that was recorded. I, I'd like a copy of that to, to share with my <laughs> wife and children. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, let me see if we can get started here. I should, okay. I am sharing. Oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, these are my disclosures. And, um, you know, I, I draw your attention. This was the invitation that I received. Uh, you can see up in the, in the left-hand corner there, September 9th, 2019. And I was invited to speak to us on an interventional endoscopy topic of your choosing pertaining to endoscopic management of gastrointestinal malignancy. September 9, 2019. So I thought to myself, well, this is wonderful. There'll be a, a long weekend in New York City. They'll be uh, staying at a trendy hotel. Uh, there'll be fine dining, of course. And uh, always a pleasure of mine is to try and catch uh, the Afro-Cuban Orchestra at the Manhattan School of Music. Um, but as we know, uh, when man plans, God laughs. And um, this was a slide from March 31st. Um, and um, I don't need to remind you uh, how our world changed um, mid-March. Um, as I was conferring with, with Dr. Sands uh, before the meeting, we in Philadelphia had about a two-week window um, from when the surge really hit in, in New York City to prepare, and, and it provided us an opportunity to offset um, a lot of the um, difficulties and sadness that uh, shrouded uh, healthcare in New York um, during the time. And I know that, that, that New York, like it always does, uh, shouldered it and, um, and is in the process of moving past it. I thought it would be useful um, 
to talk a little bit about um, how we address the, the surge and how we're uh, emerging with our resurgence. Like you, our overall goals during the surge were to provide safe and effective endoscopic services. And this, of course, meant safety for staff as well as uh, for our patients. And we established uh, real guidance uh, for inpatient endoscopy. Um, and really, we were uh, limiting uh, the consideration of endoscopy in patients under investigation and COVID positive patients. The PUIs had to be tested uh, to determine their status. And we were otherwise limiting endoscopy only to proven COVID negative patients. COVID positive patients had to fail a 12 to 24 hour um, period of supportive care. And this actually carried us throughout uh, really much of the surge. Um, outpatient endoscopy was virtually uh, eliminated um, and we limited endoscopy to true urgent and emerging cases. Um, we limited the number of staff that uh, came in contact with patients uh, physicians, uh, you know, nursing staff, as well as trainee involvement. And, and I know that that had a lot of impact and, and concern on the part of our trainees, which happily we've been able to relax um, in the past uh, month. And of course, attention to hand washing and PPE and the like. We began our uh, GI endoscopy resurgence on May 4th. And um, we uh, uh, assigned uh, levels of intensity for all our patients that had been previously scheduled were new or postponed. So urgent and emergent remained within one week or within 24 hours. And then level one were cases that we felt needed to be addressed within four weeks, level two, four to eight weeks, level three, eight to 12 weeks. And so this way we were intending to gradually accommodate um, all patients uh, requiring endoscopic services for symptomatic disease and for oncologic uh, conditions as, as listed there, uh, pushing off average risk uh, screening until um, you know, the level three period of time. We had the opportunity here to enable testing of all patients uh, initially within 24 hours, then relaxed to 48 hours and currently 72 hours. It does have to be at a pen site and we have the capacity to do that where we get results within two to 12 hours. And then we have the capacity for patients that live very far away um, that they can come in and get a rapid test uh, with a turnaround in, in two hours. And of course we've instituted, um, you know, a gradual ramp up in our volume uh, to best ensure that we can have social distancing. Uh, we've limited visitors uh, who are accompanying uh, patients. Initially they had to drop them off. And now they're allowed to have one visitor. Um, and this is what our graphic has looked like. Um, and so you can see uh, the gradual rise. Um, this comes up to uh, just a, a, a June 3rd. Um, and this, as this graphic indicates, puts us at about 72% or 75% of our BC before COVID historic baseline. Now, of course, you noticed on the graphic uh, that there was a sharp drop. On, uh, on June 1st. And of course, uh, this reflected um, uh, and, and permits an opportunity to acknowledge the acute and chronic suffering caused by racial injustice that culminated in a series of events unfolding across our country and across our own communities, New York and Philadelphia alike, over the past week. So, you know, any grand rounds. Uh, uh, presentation should be somewhat impactful and and I've made an effort to try and draw these three aspects together and and there is an opportunity for gastrointestinal endoscopy to to have an emphasis on social justice and so of course we as individuals institutions and professional societies need to recognize overt and implicit racial bias and actively work to expose and extirpate it I can say, you know, on behalf of, of work that I and, and many other people who are in attendance in this meeting have been actively involved in ensuring diversity in the staff of the professional societies and their governance and in supporting awards for research into healthcare disparities, which have been really valuable, uh, quite a valuable um, uh, evidence to support um, changes in guidelines, but have also been valuable in supporting 
uh, careers uh, of individuals who come from historically underrepresented uh, minorities. So um, we also should acknowledge that COVID-19, civil unrest, economic hardship, and virtually all gastrointestinal malignancies disproportionately harm those in underserved communities. Uh, so this is my attempt to, to try and, uh, uh, and come full circle as to why we're going to talk about uh, the serrated colon lesions and how best to manage them. One, this is something that virtually all of us do who uh, do gastrointestinal endoscopy. Two, uh, these lesions are very subtle uh, and we need to train ourselves how to detect them uh, because three, uh, they may account for um, uh, an inordinate uh, number of uh, interval cancers, that is colorectal cancers that are subsequently diagnosed in patients who had undergone uh, what had seemingly been a clearance colonoscopy within five years previously. So what I hope to do is talk about what uh, serrated colon lesions are, why they're important, how to detect them, and how to resect them. So what are serrated uh, colon lesions? So recognize that there are two major classes of precancerous polyps in the colon. And so there's the conventional adenoma, all of which are dysplastic. And as we know, they're classified into tubular villus or tubular villus. And this class of polyp is the precursor for the majority of colorectal cancers, and certainly two of the three major molecular pathways. That is the chromosomal instability pathway, which accounts for 25 to 70%. These are the sporadic colorectal cancers. And then patients uh, along the Lynch syndrome pathway, or HMPCC, which accounts for about 3% of colorectal cancers. The rest, that 10 to 15%, are, are, arise from the serrated lesion precursors. And unlike conventional adenomas, the vast majority of serrated lesions contain no dysplasia. The three serrated classes include the true traditional hyperplastic polyp, which are considered non-neoplastic, not precancerous. And then the sessile serrated polyps or sessile serrated adenomas. And lastly, a sort of a quasi category are the traditional serrated adenomas, which are in fact quite rare and often mistaken by pathologists for conventional adenomas. Their management is the same. And so the distinction is not so terribly important. So what do sessile serrated adenomas look like? And these are, are two representative um, uh, images and you can appreciate the suppleness of, of this type of lesion. Uh, these are mostly flat. Um, they take on the contour of the colon. Uh, they often will have a surrounding uh, margin of mucin, uh, but what's critically important is you'll see a loss or a differentiation in the surface pattern uh, where blunting of the blood vessels. The other typical pattern we'll see is that of the mucus cap. Um, and this is very important. It's important to recognize it up front, um, and we'll talk a little bit about how to manage it, because if, if you wash that away, uh, you can lose your, uh, your demarcation. Uh, they can be more challenging to find later on. Uh, on histopathology, uh, they essentially represent the, the, the two categories that's involved in their name. They'll have a serrated phenomena, a picket fence phenomena, and they'll also have traditional adenomatous uh, dysplasia. So they simultaneously demonstrate uh, the serrated architecture of typical hyperplastic polyps and the epithelial dysplasia of conventional adenomas. So why do we care about uh, sessile serrated adenomas? Uh, we care about them because they have the capacity or the propensity uh, for mutations along the KRAS and or the BRAF oncogene uh, lines. Uh, and these mutations can then lead to uh, hypermethylation, uh, which can result in microsatellite instability and microsatellite stability pathways towards uh, colorectal cancer. Um, and this phenomena uh, is associated with uh, an accelerated pathway to colorectal cancer um, and may account for a substantial percentage of the interval colorectal cancers, as I mentioned uh, up front. Their prevalence um, is particularly important for uh, therapeutic endoscopists. And these data come from our 2012 study that looked at uh, close to 300 patients that were referred for uh, defiant polyps. So these were 
Um, polyps that had been identified during screening or surveillance or diagnostic endoscopy that had size, shape, configuration, location that made them unsuitable for standard endoscopic or colonoscopic polypectomy technique. And as you can see, uh, circled in the red here, the vast majority of these came in the right colon between the, the cecum and the hepatic flexure, and 20% of these represented serrat serrated adenomas. So it's going to be a substantial proportion of the patients that are referred for uh, advanced uh, polypectomy techniques. So how do we detect sessile serrated adenomas? I think um, this is a, a slide that, that warrants emphasis uh, and applies to everyone uh, who's doing colonoscopy. So it requires a, a careful inspection, and that inspection should be undertaken both on insertion as well as withdrawal. You, you want to use judicious use of water flush as to reemphasize you don't want to wash that mucus cap off. It's a, it's a, it's a defining feature that enables uh, uh, you to uh, readily re-identify a lesion that you're going to take on the way back. You need to know what to look for, and I'll show some more examples shortly. Uh, you need to know where to look for them. And again, I've demonstrated that there's a, a, a real preponderance of these lesions in the right side of the colon compared to the left colon. You need to appreciate that when there is one, there are often many, at least a few. And so you, you really should be troubled if you only find one sessile serrated adenoma. Uh, you want to embrace routine retroflex uh, exam of the right colon. So as part of your routine to retroflex the colonoscope and the cecum and do a withdrawal. You want to uh, be familiar with and capable uh, to perform chromoendoscopy uh, for confirmation and delineation, most often in the form of a chromic submucosal injection solution. Uh, and also importantly, you always want to be thinking about the sessile serrated polyp syndrome. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment too. So these are a couple of images uh, from this, uh, the same patient. And here you can appreciate very subtle, but a very large laterally extending clamshell sessile serrated lesion. Here too, you see a scar. This lesion had, had, had been partially resected in the past, but all this represents sessile serrated adenoma. Subtle here, sessile serrated lesion. Um, this is uh, the same lesion where you can now see a more expansive lesion extending onto the uh, onto the proximal side of the fold, and you can appreciate the distinction when um, methylene blue to the normal saline has been injected underneath the lesion. You see a little bit of that cobblestoning, but clearly a surface that has a demarcation from the normal. And with that, when your injectate extends beyond the lateral margins of the lesion, you can much better delineate the lateral uh, uh, margins of the lesion. This is critically important to ensure that you achieve complete resection of the lesion. And that's what these should look like um, uh, post-resection. Uh, and again, uh, important during resection to take a little cuff of, uh, of normal tissue uh, surrounding it to ensure that there's no foci of uh, residual uh, adenoma. Um, this was another patient uh, that I, I wanted to uh, show. You can see this was a surveillance exam. Here's a scar from a resection that had been performed at a prior endoscopy, you can see a tattoo that had persisted there. But here, this I think very nicely uh, outlines the importance of doing a routine retroflex in the right colon. Uh, with the pediatric colonoscope retroflex in the cecum, you can now appreciate a subtle but substantial laterally spreading um, sessile serrated lesion, much better delineated now after a full insufflation. And this type of lesion is going to be required to be removed in that retroflex uh, position. So again, with getting experience and familiarity with that, not only will you uh, harness it for diagnostic purposes, but you're going to increasingly use it uh, for therapeutic purposes as well. Uh, and here is, is what you should see, you know, at further follow-up, several well-healed scars here, well-healed scar here, well-healed scar here, Maybe a little focal residue, you'd have to wash this off to determine whether or not that's a uh, sessile serrated lesion or not. I, I can tell you from biopsy tissue sampling that it wasn't. Um, but this is uh, sort of the 
uh, clean um, and clearance effect that you're uh, going to strive for. Uh, this study, I think, was important because it highlights the fact that uh, these troublesome polyps tend to uh, tend to uh, go together, uh, and so subtle sessile serrated lesion here is seen with high definition white light endoscopy, and then using uh, electronic chromo endoscopy. But this paper really points out that uh, patients that have um, high risk sessile serrated polyps are more likely to have traditional adenomas, advanced adenomas, and multiple um, uh, sessile serrated lesions, low risk as well as high risk. And um, I just want to show in this video, again, uh, as part of training on how to detect. And so you can see a slight little raise above the normal fold in the inferior aspect there. We'll wash this area. This lesion did not have a mucus cap, but you can appreciate that the surface appearance was slightly different than the surround. And then when we use uh, electronic uh, enhanced imaging in the form of, of uh, narrow band imaging, sometimes you'll need to increase your light index in the right side of the colon uh, to ensure that the, the image is bright enough. But you can appreciate that that is a distinct uh, low-grade sessile serrated adenoma. It's further important to recognize, again, that when there is one, there are many. And so I'll ask you to uh, draw your attention to the, the lower screen, and you can see a polypoid lesion here. But what's really at stake is this lesion. And this is a T1B adenocarcinoma that arose from a sessile serrated polyp. Uh, you can appreciate the, the um, morphologic features align with that. I will tell you this was uh, my own patient that I had done what I had felt was a clearance colonoscopy the year before. This patient uh, was recognized as having the sessile serrated polyp syndrome. Uh, but this is what the stakes are all about. Uh, these are very subtle, um, uh, but they're lethal if not uh, detected uh, in a timely fashion. So um, again, uh, some tools and tips for lesion recognition and, uh, and for mechanisms or ways by which you can demarcate uh, the lateral extension of the lesions. I think everyone can probably appreciate the lesion on this fold here. It's, it's in the very proximal ascending colon. You may see that a scar uh, with a focal residual uh, adenomatous tissue in the sequel bed there very nicely demonstrated here using the narrow band imaging, you can appreciate the demarcation between the normal clonic mucosa and this SSA. But this was not, not a small lesion by any stretch. Uh, when, you, when you deflect that fold behind, you can appreciate that this lesion now is seen to encompass almost 50% of the luminal circumference and may uh, you know, incorporate about four to five centimeters uh, 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 of uh, a diagonal or of a uh, diameter. We also will use um, submucosal injection, uh, not only for as a means to uh, assist in the resection, but also to help demarcate the lateral margins of the lesion. And this is my typical, I'll, I'll try to always work in the uh, the proximal most aspect of the lesion first, try and lift it up onto a plateau. Um, and we can begin our injection just at the external margin of the lesion. And you can see that by doing that, uh, that methylene blue dye or indigo carmine dye in the normal saline helps to um, uh, discriminate uh, the normal mucosa from the, uh, from the sessile serrated lesion. So you can see that once you blow this thing up, it's a pretty substantial polyp. Um, just a moment about um, the sessile polyp syndrome. Now, perhaps for historical purposes, I'll acknowledge that this is the WHO criteria. 
I don't know how long the World Health Organization is going to be able to exist without U.S. support, but for the time being, uh, the World Health Organization has put forward criteria for the sessile poly polyp syndrome, and it includes any of the following. So it's any of the following, not, not cumulative. At least five serrated polyps proximal to the sigmoid colon, two of which are greater than 10 millimeters in diameter. Any number of serrated polyps occurring proximal to the sigmoid colon in an individual as a first degree relative with serrated polyposis, and more than 20 serrated polyps of any size distributed throughout the colon. So it's something that you constantly need to think about when you encounter patients who have sessile serrated polyps, uh, because the cumulative risk of colorectal cancer in these individuals under surveillance is about 7% at five years. And the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force uh, recommends, and this is consistent with the most recent um, um, uh, guidance, uh, annual surveillance for patients with serrated polyp syndrome. Uh, and in fact, um, when these patients first come under your uh, management, you may need to use shorter intervals of colonoscopy to achieve initial clearance, maybe every uh, four to six months until you can um, ensure that you've, you, you've achieved clearance and then move to um, annual. And these have to be meticulous uh, colonoscopy exams. So a real emphasis on the quality of the prep. Sometimes we'll schedule these patients for a full hour uh, colonoscopy as opposed to our typical uh, 30 minutes to ensure there's adequate time. So how should we resect the sessile serrated adenomas? Well, for the most part, we're going to follow the principles of standard polyp resection. So for polyps that are less than or equal to 10 millimeters, cold snare resection has become the, the dominant. Uh, either hot snare or cold piecemeal resection for polyps in the 10 to 20 millimeter range. And for polyps greater than 20 millimeters, injection assisted either hot or cold piecemeal resection. And um, I just want to give, let this short video clip demonstrate the technique for cold snare resection. We are having a cold snare resection revolution um, uh, in, in gastrointestinal endoscopy, and for good reasons. Um, it's safe, it's effective, uh, and it may reduce the risk of delayed bleeding and certainly reduces the risk of perforation. And so um, uh, it's something that we're increasingly embracing. Uh, here you see a standard technique. I'm using what we call the mini snare. This is just a 15 millimeter braided snare. It's our standard snare, and we can use this for both hot and cold snare resection. You can see you chop through that. If, there's, if the tissue's too much to uh, chop through with the snare, all you need to simply do is pull it up into the face of the endoscope, and it's going to tear that tissue off. You cannot you cannot tear the muscle layer. And so you eliminate that risk of, um, of perforation. And of course, the absence of thermal energy uh, reduces, if not eliminates, the risk of delayed post-polypectomy bleeding and certainly the um, uh, post-polypectomy burn syndrome. Now, here's a, a more subtle lesion, a larger lesion. Hopefully you see that in the right hemisphere of the image. We're gonna watch that a little bit. And, and again, this, this clip emphasizes that that washing the, the mucus cap off uh, eliminates that as a, uh, a demarker uh, of the lesion. But we're prepared with, um, with uh, chromoendoscopy uh, to more readily um, re-identify it. So we'll switch to MBI, and you can again appreciate how that can be really valuable, uh, not for detection, of lesions, but for discriminating uh, the margins of uh, sessile serrated lesions. And in this case, we're prepared then with submucosal injection of uh, methylene blue tinted normal saline. And um, again, any chromic agent will do, uh, but you can very well, I think, appreciate how that injectate um, uh, creates a contrast to better identify the lateral margins of this lesion. And so once we blow that up, we can then take a snare. Now I will preferentially use a, uh, a small diameter snare uh, for these lesions. It helps reduce uh, your, um, the, the risk or tendency to grab more tissue um, than you should. Um, but that's always a welcome site there where you can look at the base and see that 
blue tinted uh, muscularis propria layer. And in this case, you can readily inspect the lateral margins to show that there's no evidence of any residual uh, serrated polyp. Now the other approach, increasingly drawing interest, is to use um, uh, thinner uh, braided snares, uh, stiffer snares, uh, to do wide area uh, saline assisted cold piecemeal resection as seen in these images. What's the advantage? Well, it's quick, it's cheap, it's easy, and it's safe. Some of the questions have been, well, what's the likelihood of leaving residual tissue since you don't have that thermal energy at the margin? What if you're not able to cut through it? Um, sometimes it can be messy because you get a little bit of acute bleeding, oozing for that matter, not, 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 uh, not hemorrhage, but oozing, certainly. Uh, and what's the risk of, of uh, incomplete resection? Well, I'll show you why uh, it can be uh, a valuable part of your armamentaria. This was a patient subsequently referred to me, um, uh, performed in another part of the city. Now that you can see this was a fairly, you know, reasonably sized sessile serrated lesion, subtle, but, you know, kudos that they picked it up. Uh, there was an effort uh, at submucosal injection, uh, but then they took a standard uh, snare uh, with the uh, thermal energy, and uh, you can appreciate the um, the bullseye or target side here, and that's a you know full thickness perforation. Uh, this patient did require uh, an operative repair. Um, so, what are the concepts in cold snaring? Well, you you want to try to establish a flat mucosal surface. You want to establish the tissue plane. You want to establish a rim of normal tissue that you want to clearly define the extent of the lesion, and then you want to inspect, careful inspection of the post-resection defect. Um, it may be valuable to use uh, a fine braided or monofilament relatively stiff snares. There are several of these available commercially in the market, but as I said, I, I routinely use a standard 15 millimeter uh, snare that can be used both for hot and cold purposes for the vast majority. Um, and this is what it can look like. Uh, so incremental submucosal injection, and it's important, again, to use um, a small snare. Um, and what we're seeing is that, um, uh, at least for small colorectal polyps, that uh, the results are equivalent, if not superior, to a hot snare polypectomy. Uh, when looking at complete resection rates, uh, they're, they're comparable. Uh, polyp uh, specimen retrieval is comparable. Uh, delayed bleeding rates are lower after cold snare polypectomy. Uh, because perforation, happily, is not uh, common in, in any approach, uh, uh, this systematic review and meta-analysis did not identify a, a difference. Uh, but uh, there are benefits in time as well, um, with hot snare polypectomy being uh, longer, um, uh, both for colonoscopy time as well as uh, polypectomy time. So cold snare polypectomy is equal to hot snare polypectomy for complete resection, is equal for specimen retrieval, and maybe superior in terms of delayed bleeding and superior in polypectomy time. Um, it also, you know, you can use it uh, in many challenging situations where you have lesions like this that overlie a fold. Um, the goal here is to, uh, you know, flatten things out uh, using um, uh, submucosal injection uh, so that you have an easier plane uh, to run your snare through. And uh, this series of images, I think, exemplifies that fairly well. What is that risk of, of incomplete resection? Um, it's important. Uh, and and Poland and his group published in the, in the CARE study, the complete adenoma resection study, that incomplete polypectomy is, is common. Um, and, uh, and it's probably more commonly than was even reported uh, in their study. Um, Incomplete resection is twice as likely to occur for larger lesions in the 10 to 20 millimeter range compared to small lesions. And importantly, and germane to this talk, is that serrated lesions had a fourfold uh, in increase or more likely uh, to be incompletely resected uh, compared to uh, uh, traditional adenomas. Um, it's also important to recognize that the incomplete resection rate was highly operator dependent 
And so um, this does require uh, individual attention and monitoring and maybe proctoring um, to uh, ensure that uh, complete resection is, is achieved. Um, and incomplete resection rates may be anywhere from the 6.5 to as high as 23%. Uh, it has long-term consequences uh, because uh, uh, managing uh, recurrences, local recurrences, after there has been an introduction of particularly thermal uh, snare energy uh, can be challenging, if not possible, and is associated with, with higher risk. And, of course, there's the risk of interval colorectal cancer, which is not only a disaster for the patient, but can be a disaster for, for the endoscopist as well. Um, this was a, a, a case that highlights, this was a, a, an incomplete resected sesalcerated lesion. This is a number of years ago, it was my case, and you can see what happened there. Despite submucosal injection, I ended up with a, a full thickness um, uh, perforation. And uh, what's important to emphasize here is that, you know, assuming you're using CO2 gas as your insufflation gas, uh, you should be prepared uh, to do a primary closure. And uh, if you recognize this in real time um, and you're able to uh, maintain your access uh, and the patient is stable, you can take the opportunity to use through the scope clips, maybe in some circumstances even an over the scope clip, but I think we have the greatest speed and facility with through the scope clips to do a primary closure here. It's really important to take your time uh, and make sure that you're opposing the uh, edges of the uh, full thickness perforation uh, adequately uh, to ensure that you would achieve a effective and uh, durable closure. Um, if you do enough complex polypectomy, you're absolutely going to encounter this, and, and it's okay. Um, you know, as long as you recognize it at the time, uh, you can close these. And while initially we would keep patients in the hospital and empirically treat them with the antibiotics, um, if I have a small perforation that I'm very satisfied I've closed uh, immediately, we will discuss it with the patient. We'll give them options. But uh, we generally will enable these patients to, to simply go home. I typically will treat them with an oral antibiotic for five to seven days. Um, and that has, uh, has, has served us very well. I'll just show this last clip here. So whenever this happens, you know, not only do you check the patient's vital signs, but you want to stop and check your own pulse too. And uh, recognize that you have the tools uh, and you have the staff and you have the wherewithal to manage your own adverse event. In a, uh, in, a, in a very positive patient outcome way. So uh, to summarize, um, what I've tried to do is uh, uh, have you appreciate the importance of sessile serrated polyps, uh, to know how to recognize them, how to seek and destroy them, and to think about uh, the sessile polyp syndrome. And um, with that, um, I, I wish you all good health, peace, justice, and prosperity. Thank you. Chris, you could unmute. There you go. Okay, that was fantastic, Greg. Thank you so much. Um, while people are gathering their questions, I'm gonna ask you two quick ones. Uh, number one, do we know why there's a predilection for the right colon for these lesions? And number two, where do you sit in the debate about whether or not the resection edges need to be ablated with APC or uh, snare tip soft coax? Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's easier for me to answer the first question. Um, because it is uh, an exposition of ignorance. I think uh, not only do I not know, but I don't think anybody knows uh, why they occur uh, more commonly in the right colon. Um, uh, no doubt it is some manifestation of the 
you know, the micro environment uh, in the right colon, whether it's, it's, um, um, uh, whether it's purely microbiome mediated or it's um, uh, whatever the milieu is on the right side uh, seems to be responsible for uh, their, their prevalence uh, and presence there. As it relates to um, the routine use of snare tip or APC coagulation of margins of resection, I, I think there is a role for that on an individualized case basis. I think first and foremost, the emphasis should be on ensuring that you, you're best ensuring that you take a small rim of, uh, of normal tissue uh, during your piecemeal resection. Uh, and if you're effectively doing that, I, I think the evidence would support that um, that routine uh, thermal ablation uh, does not improve outcomes. If, however, uh, you have, um, and, and maybe less so with the sesalcerid polyps, but with traditional bulky nodular um, uh, adenomas, um, if, if with careful visual inspection, you see foci that may represent focal residual adenoma, uh, it, it, it probably, it may add some value. It does add time, it may add risk. Uh, the, in the comparative trials, uh, they have shown a re reduced local recurrence. It's not been associated with higher risk, but you know what? Those trials have all been conducted by people who've dedicated their lives to uh, expert advanced uh, polypectomy. And so it may or may not be so well translated to uh, some of us ordinary uh, endoscopists. If I may, I'm seeing the handsome face of, of Professor Wei on my screen, and I wonder, I wonder if he would like to weigh in with uh, with an opinion to either of those questions. And before he does, though, he was clapping, Greg, for your closure of the um, <laughs> perforation. Yeah. Greg, uh, uh, thanks for the very great talk on sessile serrated lesions. Um, my question is, how often do you actually use a saline lift to remove these lesions? Sometimes they're quite extensive and um, rambling around the colon. Do you uh, then take those off cold or do you always use injection and take them off hot? Yeah. So, you know, Jerry, historically, I, you know, I think all of us uh, evolved uh, during the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years to principally use uh, thermal snare resection. Uh, and, and it's only more recently that we're beginning to re-explore um, the wider applications of cold snare resection. I, I, I stand that my, my, my standard of practice still remains for the most part using saline assisted uh, technique and and using thermal snare resection but a, a small uh, diameter snare um, and you're right some of these big rambling lesions I find that as, as hopefully some of the um, videos demonstrated that the injection of a chromic agent is really critical to um, identifying and maintaining recognition of the lateral uh, extent of the lesion to ensure that complete resection. As you know, once you start grasping tissue, cutting through it either cold or hot, uh, that um, the, the margins uh, can, can become a little irregular. And so I think having that, that uh, chromo aid to, uh, to know where your lesion margins is, 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 a, is a great advantage. And certainly if you're gonna use thermal snare resection for these, for lesions that are greater than two centimeters in size, I think you really have to use some submucosal injectate to reduce the risk of unwittingly grabbing a muscularis propria in, in the very compliant right side of the colon. Greg, when you take off a polyp with a cold snare and you can't pull through it, what do you do then? Yeah, uh, so you let it go. Uh, you open your snare up and then you grab it again. And uh, you don't add heat to it and then uh, cut through with heat? Or is that, is that likely, more likely to make a perforation? Well, you know, if, if, if you can't cut through it with, with, um, uh, with, with, with cold snare technique, 
you, you may have too much tissue. So, you know, as what my first approach is, is to see if my assistant can, can guillotine it with the snare. When that fails, I, 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 I will say, I won't say gently, I'll pull, uh, you know, with, with some degree of, uh, of, of uh, energy uh, up to the face of the endoscope. Uh, if that, if it's still too much, then, yeah, I open the snare up, re-grasp it, re-attempt those two procedures. I think if that fails, I might stop, re-inject under that before introducing electrosurgical energy. What do you think? I agree with you. I think that uh, if you grab too much tissue and you can't cut through with a cold snare, uh, you're likely to make a hole if you add heat to it. Yeah. Good. Craig, I have a question for you. First, uh, thanks for the shout out at the beginning about the, you know, COVID stuff in Philadelphia and the, the comments about, you know, social justice and, and all that's gone on the last couple of weeks are very much appreciated. So thanks. Um, you, you sound like we're sort of almost done with hot snares. So um, what do you think? I, I think we're not there yet. Uh, as, as, as you know, um, you know, a cold snare polypectomy is not new. And we, we've all employed it to, to some extent uh, throughout our careers. Um, um, adoption of uh, new techniques uh, usually takes about a decade. Uh, and, uh, you know, I introduce it in this manner because I think it is important for us to begin to obtain our own experiential um, um, uh, familiarity with it uh, and but my prediction is that it's going to be increasingly widely adopted for uh, particularly for um, uh, wide area piecemeal resection now it, it doesn't apply to all lesions it is I think well suited for ses for sesoceratic lesions because they are uh, well they're they're flat um, and they have a relatively uniform vascular supply. When you have nodular or bulky sessile serrated or, or, or traditional adenomas polyps, there, there's, there's a, 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 an increased likelihood that the, the submucosal tissue beneath it will ruck up and really become too dense for you to cut through, number one. Number two is that those more bulky nodular lesions are more likely to have um, uh, you know, larger diameter perforating vessels that uh, are going to be associated with um, with bleeding. So I think we, I think this is a time to explore. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity for uh, clinical research uh, to best identify uh, which lesions might be best suited for cold wide area piecemeal saline assisted cold snare resection uh, versus uh, thermal snare resection. You know, I have to say. For someone who spent a big part of his career taking out big polyps, I mean, the, the bane of my existence is, is and I quote patients, up to a 7% risk of delayed post-polypectomy bleeding after removing, uh, you know, lesions greater than two centimeters, particularly in the right colon. And, you know, as you know, it can occur anywhere from 12 hours to 12 days after the procedure. While most of the bleeding is short-lived, self-limited, and non-destabilizing, rarely it's substantial, requiring patients to go to foreign emergency departments and, 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 you know, that now the situation's out of your control and they may require blood products. They may require hospitalization. They may require repeat colonoscopy, interventional radiologic procedures. So it's, it really is, um, you know, uh, uh, we've, we have been really unsuccessful, I think for the most part in lowering that, um, what I consider unacceptably high rate of delayed post polypectomy bleeding uh, after a section of, of large and complex polyps. I'd be interested in hearing, uh, you know, you, the wealth of, uh, of knowledge and experience at Sinai. Uh, uh, any thoughts uh, on, on, on wh where, where those opportunities lie beyond, say, cold snare resection? I mean, I'll, uh, and we have a bunch of other questions pending, so we'll try to keep it short, but um, my, my personal adoption has been to continue with using heat, but I have adopted EndoCut as my uh, uh, energy of choice. Um, it took me a long time to adopt it, but
but I found that uh, anecdotally, at least, I was having less delayed bleeding after using EndoCut. And uh, just based on the publications that have come out in the past uh, few years, my practice has been to prophylactically clip, and this is where Jerry starts to cringe, uh, for these large, uh, you know, two centimeter or bigger polyps in the right colon, the data suggests that there's a higher risk of delayed bleeding in those lesions. So I tend to use endocut and I tend to uh, clip close uh, those defects if possible. 50% yeah. of the time, it's not possible to close those clips. It, my experience with cold snare, I don't know if Nikhil or Satish is on the line, but my experience with cold snare, uh, you, you hit the right word. It can be very messy. Um, and it, in my experience, it, uh, I've been slow to adopt it. It, it. For large lesions, it tends to take me longer because I'm dealing with intraprocedural oozing. Uh, as you said, it's not hemorrhage, but it's enough that it, it makes you stop and have to, you know, uh, irrigate more, clean the field more, et cetera. Um, so I know there is the growing revolution, I agree, but my personal preference has been use endocut and clips uh, for most of these lesions. I see Nikhil's on, there he has a comment. Yeah, so we're actually part of a multi-center study um, with Heiko Pohl and Doug Rex amongst others to look at sort of this cold snare um, revolution. There also was recommendations in a um, uh, US task force uh, recent guidelines to sort of, you know, that, that sort of alluded towards more of the cold revolution, particularly for smaller polyps. Um, the study that, that we're looking at is for cold snare EMR for polyps that are greater than 20 uh, millimeters in size. And it is challenging to do these. I think some of the things that we've learned throughout the process is that, um, and some of this you talked about, is that you wanna make sure that you have sort of a normal edge, that you, that you get some of the normal tissue, and then you really can't be too aggressive with uh, the size of your snare. So you, you don't wanna try to capture too much tissue because you won't be able to cut through. And then you run into the problem of, it gets caught up on some tissue, trying to release it sometimes can be difficult, or you have to really choke up really hard, like you suggested, and have your tech really try to squeeze through to guillotine that tissue. It does have a higher incidence of periprocedural bleeding, but you can almost always control that. Um, and we're seeing almost no delayed bleeding when we're doing a cold snare EMR. So um, the way that we can reduce our delayed bleeding rates is by switching to cold, but there are some trade-offs in that you can't do a big on-block resection. The procedure time may be a little bit longer. Um, you may have some more periprocedural bleeding, um, but, but by and large, it's the, the cases we're able to do um, pretty successfully with cold snare EMR. Hopefully that data will be coming out um, at some point next year. I want to make sure there's two questions. Uh, Steve and Peter both had some questions. Uh, Steve? Greg, thanks so much for the uh, wonderful overview and great videos. Um, two comments, really. First, uh, serrated polyposis syndrome. Um, you know, it is listed under polyposis syndromes that are typically thought to be hereditary or genetic, but so far there's no gene that has yet been described for that. So we don't have that to go on. Uh, the other comment uh, relates to whether we can detect serrated uh, polypos polyps or polyposis by non-invasive means. And uh, the only technique that I'm aware of that has any hope to find sessile serrated polyps is Cologuard. Um, CTC misses them, FIT test misses them. And in fact, in the deep sea study, uh, comparing uh, FIT test to Cologuard, Cologuard picked up almost 50% of sesoserated polyps versus 10% with fit testing. Um, and that's because there's methylation in, you know, th these polyps tend to be highly methylated, as you said. And because the Cologuard has a couple of methylated markers, it can pick it up. And in fact, uh, in a separate analysis that David Alquist did, if you look at the larger sesoserated polyps over two centimeters, uh, you can pick up about two thirds of them uh, with Cologuard. So that's one advantage of uh, Cologuard over fit testing is picking up SSPs. It's not something that people often talk about or think about, but it is worth considering. Yeah, I, I, I agree uh, you know, with both your uh, comments. And it, as you said, it's the, the designation of the syndrome is, is purely based on uh, 
the clinical features. Uh, we don't have uh, the, that molecular um, testing at this time. And yeah, it's, of course, that col col the, the, the methylation component of Cologar was, you know, this, this was really right in its sweet spot. Of course, the only thing that Cologar doesn't do is remove them. So uh, we'll, we're, happily, we'll still have room for colonoscopy. But, you know, it is true that if a colonoscopy is being done for a positive fit test or a positive cologuard, yeah. the adenoma detection rate is higher. We, we, we pick up more lesions, both adenomas and SSPs, if we're doing the procedure because of a positive cologuard or positive fit test. I, I, that, you hit the nail right on the head there. There's, there, is, there is nothing more tedious than doing a, uh, a, a diagnostic colonoscopy after a positive cologuard because, you know, you damn well better find something. That's for sure. Peter, I think uh, we'll give you the last word here. Um, I wanted to ask, what is your algorithm for calling back these people with the SSAs uh, compared to with the traditional uh, polyps? Yeah, so uh, uh, assuming that they did not meet the criteria of sessile uh, polyp syndrome, we use uh, the... Um, um, the standard guidelines as, as one would for traditional uh, adenomas, three to five years, right? Depending on size and number of lesions. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Greg, thank you so much for an outstanding Grand Rounds. Uh, sorry you couldn't be here in person, but uh, I'm sure in the future we'll, we'll get you, uh, we'll convince you to come to New York. So uh, have a safe trip back to the endo unit and uh, everyone has a good weekend. Stay safe out there. Let me just say um, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's, it's actually really good to see all of you people, uh, even by Zoom. And, um, and I appreciated the opportunity to, uh, uh, to, you know, to, to test um, what may be part of our new normal and in, in giving a, a virtual grand rounds. Uh, honestly, I still I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm there with you uh, from a community standpoint. And um, I wish you all uh, the very best. And I look forward to seeing you in person and hopefully soon enough. So take care, stay safe. God bless. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thank you. Thank you.